Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. It is the beginning of January. Actually, it's the middle of January, amazingly. Um, this is Lynn Vartan. And so school is back in session, which means the Apex Hour is back on. So we'll be here with you uh, every week at 3 p.m. And, and showcasing the guests that come and speak at Southern to Utah University. Today, my guest in the studio is Dr. James Ayton, Jim Ayton, as we We'd like to call him, who gave a great talk today uh, on his new book, and we're going to be talking about it more as the time goes on. So welcome to the studio, Jim. Nice to be here again. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. This lecture today uh, was our 2019 Faculty Distinguished Lecture. Now, you are no stranger to this particular activity. I think you've done it a few times. Is that right? That's right. I, this is my fourth time. Oh, my gosh. And do you mind kind of taking us through what the other ones were like? Um, very different, uh, probably because of technology. <laughs> uh, the first one on John Wesley Powell was just a straight lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one that I did on the San Juan River, my San Juan River book, was in 2000, 2001. Uh, I actually had slides a slide projector for that one. Wow. Uh, so I had to set up the screen and do all that stuff. <laughs> and uh, and then the third one, I actually was able to do PowerPoint uh, and the one today. Yeah. And each one of them represented some different point in your scholarship and different studies and, right. and correlated to a book mo in most or if not all cases. Yeah, oh. yeah all of them. Uh, my subject has become the Colorado Plateau, and so I'll, all the things that I've done are either about explorers, artists, or rivers of the Colorado Plateau. And I want to get into more detail in that as well, but uh, if somebody asks you why the Colorado Plateau, how did that come to be your inspiration? Well, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, my last year in graduate school I came out to visit my brother, who lives in Springdale, right outside of Zion. Oh. Fell in love with the area, found out there was a job opening, and I applied and got lucky, mm -hmm. and um, came here in 1980 and just absolutely fell in love with the place and started trying to learn everything I could about it and um, just wanted to know all the stories of the place and everything I could, and and one thing led to the other. That's and amazing. Research projects. So, did were the the plateau itself? I mean, I know that you're very active in river running and this right. kind of thing. Did that start right from the get go? And and have you always been? I mean, once you got here, did you start running rivers right away? Uh, I started uh, three years after I got here, uh -huh. so I was doing a lot of hiking here, of course. Yeah. And uh, my brother had gotten into river running, and so in 1983, I did my first trip, and I was completely hooked. I you know, bought a raft and started doing it. And then that sort of led me into being interested in John Wesley Powell, um, the the first person down the Colorado River. And so I started, was curious about some things about Powell and that led to research and articles and books on that. My first faculty lecture and then then my first river trip was on the San Juan, and so as I was finishing the PAL project, I, there had been some books out on river history, and I thought, well, no one's done the San Juan, so I sort of got into that, and yeah. one thing led to the other. 
Well, I'm really curious about, I mean, uh, the, just, just river running in general. Cause I mean, I moved to this area from California 10 years ago and hiking is the natural kind of first go, but I find myself drawn more and more to, to, to river running or floating or mm-hmm. what is it about it that, that is so, um, transfixing? I mean, what, what draws you in particular? Um, that's a good question. I think uh, a, a way to see the canyons that uh. you would normally in hiking. And there's something about just being on the water, mm. which I didn't really do when I was growing up. Uh. Uh, and But once I got on the water, I just felt completely at home there. There's just something about that rhythm of going down and 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 being on the river and being there all day and just the way the, the rapids and the flow of the water and then being just on the beaches. Those are some of my favorite experiences at the night, sitting around, having a beer, a glass of wine and watching the canyon go by. It sounds magical. It is magical. It's the most fun you can have. Oh my gosh. How long is a typical trip? I mean, I know they probably range. Uh, Most of our trips usually run about uh, seven days. Ah. The the Grand Canyon is a longer trip. That's Mm -hmm. 16, 18 days. I once did a uh, a January Grand Canyon trip that was almost a month. Wow. And cold. It was cold. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so if anybody, I mean, do you have any recommendations? I'm, of course, speaking for myself, yeah. but maybe there are others out there as well. If you have any recommendations for people who maybe want to get involved in doing this kind of thing, where where would one start? Um, well, you can go to the Outdoor Rec Center here and you can rent equipment. Right. Uh, Obviously, you want to start on something super easy, Mm -hmm. and probably you want to start out with an inflatable kayak, which is like a canoe, but Uh inflated, and start out in flat water trip. There are lots of different uh, flat water trips you can do around the area, Uh or ones with really little rapids like Uh the daily above Moab. Uh, So that would be one way of doing it. Uh Another way would be to go on a commercial trip to kind of get the feel of what it's like and if you think you might want to take the next step to actually paddling or rowing. Okay. I would not suggest just renting a raft okay. and um, going down a river that has rapids. Right. Um, at least if unless you went with someone who really knows what they're doing. Exactly. And you mentioned our SCU Outdoor Recreation Center, which is a great resource um, mm-hmm. right here on campus. So anybody listening, definitely please look it up right here in our student center. Just an incredible resource for all kinds of uh, not just information, but gear. Um, there's guiding available as far as I know and all kinds of things. There are group, so. group hikes and group trips that are done all right. periodically. And I think there have been some river trips done by led by faculty here, mm-hmm. not me, but Johnny McLean and mm-hmm. Bridget Estep and others. All right. Okay. Well, you are from originally from Kentucky and then made your way here. You've lived in Kentucky and Utah and and also a couple other states. Yes. I went to college in Mobile, Alabama, uh-huh. at a small Jesuit liberal arts school uh-huh. called Spring Hill. I was uh-huh. there for four years. Graduated in English, and then I went to graduate school at the University of Kentucky mm-hmm. for my master's, and then went to Ohio University for my PhD. Mm. And from Ohio, you came here to Springdale. I mean, to uh, <laughs> well, Springdale has yeah. its allure, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I'd love to get into talking about the Crimson Cowboys. So, the most recent book, and it was published just a month or two ago. Is that right? Right, it came out first of December. And so the the book title is The Crimson Cowboys, The Remarkable Odyssey of the 1931 Claflin Emerson Expedition. Mm. Um, And so the first question I have, and and I know a little bit about this from the research, but for our listeners out there, who are the Crimson Cowboys and why are they called the Crimson Cowboys? Okay. Well, first they're called the Crimson Cowboys because this is Harvard's color, Mm -hmm. the crimson that like we're the Thunderbirds, the right, T-Birds, right. they're the Crimson. Uh, so my co-author came up with that okay. that name. Uh-huh. Uh, so they were a, a group of archaeologists, archaeology students mainly, with one teacher uh, who came out uh, to the Utah in 1928, 29, 30, and 31 
to begin surveying what was then called the northern periphery. Most archaeology attention was focused more on the Four Corners, ancestral Puebloans, or who we call the Anasazi. Mm -hmm. But the sort of godfather of Southwest archaeology, Alfred V. Kidder, said, we need to know what's going on north of here. Uh, who Were these the same people? Were they different culturally, whatever? So right. he funded or he talked two wealthy Boston businessmen into funding these expeditions to survey the northern periphery. So they came out in the summers of 28, 29, 30, 31. And the last year was the was sort of the uh, the ultimate trip mm -hmm. of the four. It was the longest horseback archaeology trip in American history. Right. And in the process of those four years, the Claflin Emerson team uh, discovered, identified, and defined the Fremont culture, which stands um, different from the ancestral Puebloans, a, a separate culture. I see. There was interaction between the two, but that's a, a question a that has come up quite a bit. Yeah. So the the Anastasi were more to the south, more to the south, four corners, uh, and, and south. not this group. No, okay. they're north and west of the Colorado River. So, for example. Um, the Black Ridge is sort of the dividing line over here in, in western Utah between the Fremont and the, and the ancestral Pueblo. And so up here in Cedar City, northward is Fremont. Um, uh, Escalante River is sort of another dividing line. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, some of the groups that were studied around the Escalante River are sometimes called the Free Saze. Oh. Um, the there was interaction between the two. North of the Escalante River, Colorado River is the Fremont. And so when people refer to the Fremont sites and the Fremont, this is what they're referring to, the, this yes. this area, um, the Fremont people, and the, the exhibition in the book is part of that. That's right. Okay. And the name, unfortunately, was given to them because Noel Morris, one of the Claflin Emerson archaeologists who was working over by Capitol Reef at Fish Creek Cove, uh, where he said, this is a different culture. He named them after the river there, the oh. Fremont River, named after John C. Fremont, the famous explorer. Oh. So it's a rather unfortunate term I see. to describe these, these people who, uh, of course, we have no idea what they call themselves, but... Right. Anyway, it's taken on the name Fremont. And I'm not an archaeologist, but in my rather simplistic understanding, one of the differences between the ancestral Puebloan and Fremont peoples, uh, the ancestral Puebloans were much more uh, full-time engaged in farming. I see. The, the Fremont were part-time farmers, part-time hunter-gatherers, depending on the climate and and other factors. Oh, so I see. So they were not as heavily invested in full-time farming and full-time sedentary um, life way oh, um, I as see. the ancestral Puebloans. Oh, okay. That that clears that up for me really s significantly, and I understand it a lot more. Thank you. Um, a, a question about this group, this expedition. It, it was made up of mostly of students. Is is that <clears throat> unusual for that time, or is that something that we that you've seen in other? I cases? don't think it was unusual for the time. Of course, archaeology was in its infancy then. Mm -hmm. um, Harvard had the first program in anthropology in the country, and the Peabody was the first um, anthropology museum. So they were, as best as I can tell, sort of making it up as they as they went. Right. And uh, so they had the one teacher or director and then five students. Two of them were graduate students and three undergrad. Wow. What an amazing time. Yeah. Well, I'd love to get back and talk about some more detail about the book. But in the meantime, I think it's time to listen to a song. Um, as you know, we tend to, I tend to play lots of a variety of things. And the first song I have to play for you is called The Path from Gabu. Um, and the artist is Sekau Keita. Um, this is an, an, an African influence song. And this is KSU Thunder 91.1. The Apex Hour.
right. Well, welcome back, everyone. That was The Path from Gabu, and the artist is Sekal Kaida. Um, in case you want to find out more, it's just an incredible artist, incredible um, sound, and, and, and all of his music is great. That is spelled S-E-C-K-O-U, and last name K-E-I-T-A. Um, my name is Lynn Vartan, and you're listening to The Apex Hour. We are in the studio with Jim Ayton, who is talking about his most recent book. So welcome back. Thank you. The book is called The Crimson Cowboys, The Remarkable Odyssey of the 1931 Claflin Emerson Expedition. And I'd love to talk about some more um, in the book. Um, th- the first question was, did anything, uh, I'm sure a lot surprised you, but did anything really surprise you uh, in, in this process of, of researching this particular exhibition, this particular group of people and what they found? That's a good question. Um, I think one thing that surprised me, and I don't know why I was surprised at this, was how organized they were. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, it's Harvard after all, so you figured they'd be on top of things. Yeah. But uh, when I started looking at all the correspondence and the planning and the, the receipts and the uh, all of that, I was just amazed at how well thought out every part of it was interesting uh, you know in terms of what to buy you know where to get the maps what maps who's been there before getting information from those people um, sending out the head guy dave russ to reconnoiter uh, everything beforehand to kind of get things set up uh, the shopping list wow. i was just like man this this guy, Donald Scott, the director, was amazingly organized. And especially at that stage of things when these kinds of organized expeditions were in their infancy. Not that common. Yeah. And uh, it was their fourth season being out, but it was the only season where they did a horse pack trip before right. they were in places where they could mostly drive in uh-huh. and, you know, bring trucks in and, and then camp at a place and excavate. Right. So... Um, they really had to plan things out, and then then he pulled it off so well. They, yeah. they, as far as we know, didn't have any major problems. No one got hurt. Yeah. Um, well, I'm curious about the 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 research component. Now, you worked with um, a, a co-author on it, mm-hmm. and how did that collaboration come to be? How did this this particular project first mm-hmm. cross your desk? I was writing a book on Desolation Canyon. And I sort of re-met my co-author, Jerry Spangler, in 2003. Uh, I talked with him a lot about my what I was doing. And then in 2006, I came on board with his organization, the Colorado Plateau Archaeological Alliance, a non-archaeological nonprofit, and started doing trips with him down Desolation Canyon, surveying the canyon. He had gotten a grant to do surveys, so I was going down, helping him do archaeology surveys, eventually got on the board, became the board president. And during that time, Jerry was writing a lot of different things, but he had been starting to work on this Claflin Emerson project starting in 2002 or three. Okay. Uh, He had been going back to Harvard, and so we talked a lot about it. Um, You know, I was doing my book, then I was doing the Jimmy Jones art book, Mm -hmm. and he was doing other books and reports. And then when I was finishing up the Jimmy Jones project, I knew that he was sort of stuck. Mm. And so I said, you know, do you need help? Do you want me to come on and help and do the parts that you were talking about? And he said, yeah, I'd really like that. So then we sort of laid out what he needed me to do. And then I started in on doing it. Now, uh, Desolation Canyon, for anybody who may not know, is part of this area. That's right. And so it's it's strongly connected. It's right through the middle of the area they surveyed, which is called the Tava Putz Plateau. It's in northeast Utah. So if you've ever been on I-70 and headed across Utah, uh, heading east, uh, it's just north of Green River, Utah, that whole plateau. And what was your research before? Because you've written about Desolation Canyon. Right. I did a history of Desolation Canyon, so the history of the the indigenous people, uh, the history of the ranches, the 
the history of river running there and so forth. So I covered some of the same area, but not I didn't really deal with the Claflin Emerson expedition, but I did deal with the Fremont culture. Right. So it seems like a very natural collaboration. Right. So then. I had a leg up on uh, a lot of the stuff that he wanted me to do, which was to write about the history, the ranches, and so mm-hmm. forth, uh, as well as um, writing about who the people were on right. the trip, right. researching who they were, their, where they came from, and then what happened to them. And that was one of the things that came up this morning that I thought was really interesting. You were you were saying that really, I mean, you found all of, out about these students because they they weren't necessarily writing in their journals exactly. personal stuff. Their journals were all scientific data. Yeah. And I'm sure they were instructed to do that. Mm-hmm. So there's no personal stuff to speak of. But when I went back to Harvard, uh, I researched first at the Peabody, and then I went over to the Pusey, which has all the records of Harvard University itself, uh-huh. where student records are kept. I was sitting in the reading room, waiting for them to bring out the files on student records, and I look up on the shelves, and there are yearbooks. Oh. I went, oh, I didn't think of this. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of information in yearbooks. So I started pulling off the yearbooks, knew when they graduated, found all, you know, what clubs they were part of, did they play sports, all these things. Oh, how cool. Then I kept looking up there, and I saw these other books. Harvard University, at least used to, I don't know if they do anymore, when you graduate every five years— uh, there's a book compiled of your class. You write in, and in a pa- page or two, you tell them what you've been doing. Okay. So I was able to follow out every five years all of these guys' lives. Oh, my gosh. Where they were working, who they were married to, how many kids they had, what they thought about life, who you know. And so that was like the serendipitous gold mine of figuring out who they were and who they became. What a great tradition. Yeah. That's a great find. And then I had no idea that was there. Yeah. Well, I would like to ask a little bit more about the collaboration process um, with your co-author. Mm-hmm. How, I mean, collaborations can happen in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, were you sending manuscripts back and forth? Were you meeting in person? Were you dictating? And, and then, sh- I mean, how are you actually functioning in the collaboration mm-hmm. on the writing? Well, we sort of, you know, lined out you know, what Jerry's responsibility would be and what mine would be. Mm -hmm. And so we each wrote our respective parts. Um, Largely, I wrote chapters 1 and and Mm -hmm. 10, but he provided sort of the context in those. He wrote the main narrative of the trip, and then he took my parts and wove them into his narrative, the historical parts. And then... Of course, we would just trade pieces back and forth, um, editing each other's work. Uh, And mostly, I was doing the editing. Um, He was was so busy, um, so I was doing a lot of the editing of of his work and sort of, in my own way, refining his style (laughs) uh, to sort of align more with mine. And and then... um, But yeah, it worked really well. Yeah, great. And the tone, I mean, I imagine as such a developed writer yourself, the tone and matching. We have a little bit different writing styles. Uh Uh, Jerry tends to be a little more uh, loquacious than I am, Uh tends to write longer sentences, uh, which is interesting because he was trained as a journalist. Oh. But um, so in my editing of his work, I would often be cutting things down, (laughs) which he seemed to be okay with. Um, oh, cool. He didn't have a problem with it. And we get along really well. I mean, we're mm-hmm. like brothers. And yeah. um, plus, I understood that, you know, he was the lead author. And so, you know, I always ref- defer to him in terms of where we were heading with the manuscript and what we wanted to do. And, and how I could help. And did I hear correctly that there's a future collaboration in the works? Yes, we're talking about another book. It, it's This is Jerry's idea, another book on archaeology, the history of archaeology, uh, looking at the history of the interpretation and excavation of the Fremont culture in Utah since mm. the first Anglos came and began observing these sites and then finally beginning to excavate them. And then what has been thought and learned about 
the Fremont culture through time, through largely the 20th century, and what these different significant excavations taught us about what we know about the Fremont. So we're talking to our editor up at the University of Utah about a possible book. Great. Well, we will look forward to it. One of the things that I think is true of all of your books is, and and uh, Earl mentioned this in his introduction today, is that they also have a gorgeous visual element to them. Um, you are so meticulous with photos, and in this case, both historic photos, color photos of the area, this kind of thing, which um, uh, lends me to ask about the field work, because I know mm -hmm. that's a part of it that mm -hmm. is a favorite of yeah. yours. Can you talk a little bit about the field work that went into this particular book? Well, there were a number of river trips down Desolation Canyon because that was the best way to, to relocate the sites. I see. Is by going down the river. And because many of their um, surveys were going up the side canyons in the same way. So we were just kind of following their path. So, and that's right up my alley as mm -hmm. river trips. So, yeah. and we had a number of people helping us, volunteers. Mm -hmm. So we had their notes and we had their photographs. And so we, go up a canyon and try to find it based on the photographs. They were often inaccurate with the mileage. Oh. So they would say about a mile and a half or two miles, but they had no way to really accurately right. determine how far they were going up. So in a couple of cases, we never found the sites because huh. they misestimated the um, the mileage. In, in some cases, they underestimated, like in Florence Creek, I, we never found them there. They were w beyond where even we walk, which was about eight miles up the canyon. Oh, wow. In Chandler, they overestimated the mileage, and the sites were much closer to, to the river. Um, uh. So that was one way we found the sites. The others were places we could often drive to. Some of them were difficult four-wheel drive, mm -hmm. you know, roads getting into certain canyons mm -hmm. and then hiking from there. To, to find the sites. And while you were there sort of retracing their steps, I mean, did you, uh, were you struck by sort of remembering them doing it oh, and course. how different it would be or? Yeah, trying to imagine um, doing this on horseback and, uh, you know, just looking for things. Uh, yeah. Sometime it they're really obvious and then other times they're really hard. And it's one of the things we point out in the book. They pass by so many, to us, obvious sites that they right. didn't stop at. Right. Why didn't they? We don't know. Huh. Um, but yeah. it, it's definitely different riding on a horse or moving that fast versus walking and finding. Right. But, you're yeah, you're always thinking, wow. Yeah. And and then some of the places that were up so high and so difficult that re required climbing. Yeah. There were just other some sites we didn't we kind of went up to them and said, "No, this is too dangerous. We can't get up there yeah. well, one of the things that that came up today and and I think is interesting is is uh the in the book there's there's the talk of some sites being looted just mm -hmm. before they get yeah. there or just you know around that time and then one of the questions today was um do you have any concerns mm -hmm. about exposing these sites to potential looters or what have you um can you talk a little yeah, bit about that that's aspect? a great question um i do always have that concern um and i <clears throat> of course rely on jerry the very experienced archaeologist who's one of the most well-known advocates for protection of cultural resources in the region. Uh, but uh, we are not, we don't give exact locations of places. Uh, plus, we ran everything by the Bureau of Land Management state archaeologists to make sure that, um, you know, we weren't revealing anything that they didn't want revealed. And uh, in all Everything but one case, he said, you're fine. He had us change the wording on one place mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that passed muster. But most of these sites, many of them are known already. Uh, very, very few sites around the region that have not been already looted. Wow. It's a rare site. I, I don't know. I guess been. it's a naive question, but what, what do, what's the point of looting sites? Just Money. To, 
Oh. You can sell these to artifacts. Invest, artifacts to investors. I see. Now, it's completely illegal. Right. The Archaeological Resource Protection Act of 1976, uh, $25,000, $50,000 fine, five years in jail maximum. But um, there's a lot of money to be made. I didn't realize that was such a huge industry, unfortunately. And I was talking to lunch about this to my table. Uh, in you can't blame the museums, but part of the interest in loot in and digging up these sites was created by the museums who came from the east in the early twentieth century, who employed these local people and said, "We're looking for these these places. Can you help us find them?" And they did, and then they just kept doing it, and they kept digging it up. And there, so there's a market, but the the museums helped create that. Not that they're to blame and not that these people are not criminals. They are, but um, so it's a big problem. I see. But it's money. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that explanation. It's time for another musical break here in the Apex Hour. Um, The next song I have for you is a song called Give My Body Back by The Low Anthem. And we'll be back with more after this song here on the Apex Hour, KSUU Thunder 91.1. There were deserts on the seafloor, mountains higher than any peak you'll ever see up upon dry land. As I fall, I give my body back as I fall. Past the sunken empire, seaweed forests swayed, hewn to the limestone road, ancient merchants laid underwater cyclones. Tearing at my skin I see the edges soften As I shed some part back in As I fall I give my body back As I fall In the world I leave behind The supper spread as weight Cutlery of silver Salt and pepper shake The octopus is guarding The fire garden grow Walking on my heels now The water took my toes as I fall I give my body back as I fall I give my body back as I fall Okay, well, welcome back to the Apex Hour. This is Lynn Vartan, and uh, you're listening to KSU Thunder 91.1. That song was just a little short song called Give My Body Back by the Low Anthem. Kind of cool, chill vibe there. I'm joined in the studio with Dr. James Ayton, our distinguished faculty lecturer for 2019. And we're talking about his most recent book, The Crimson Cowboys. Um, But we're also going to get into some of your other books. I'd love to to talk about some of the other things you've written. And first of all, to tell our audience, where can they find things? I mean, Amazon, of course, but yes. your current publisher is? University of Utah Press is okay. the publisher for this book. Great. So University of Utah Press, you can go to their website, yeah. find the book. SEU Bookstore has it. Uh, I don't know what other bookstores <laughs> do, but. Yeah, and then you can definitely find it online. And hmm. um You've written about, okay, so John Wesley Powell, right. and his significance is the first person to really run the Colorado, is right. that? And, right. and through and Grand Canyon. Th- mm-hmm. Through the Grand Canyon. Yep. And so that you've written about him. And then you also have The River Knows Everything, which is about Desolation Canyon. Right. And Correct. what is that the history? That's the history of Desolation Canyon. Yeah. Okay, great. And the various peoples who lived there over time. 
Okay. And then also there's river flowing from sunrise. And where does that fall in? I know that's about the lower San Juan. Right. And- there was an earlier book. Uh, that's an environmental history. Oh, okay. So environmental history is a little bit different than human history. It looks at the interaction of people and landscape. Mm. So how various groups of people came to the San Juan River, starting with the Paleolithic hunters, the Clovis people, uh, how they interacted with the landscape, uh, what they found, how they affected it, how they changed it, how they made a living off of it. Oh, wow. That's really interesting, too. And I mean, I think that that's something that people would really enjoy knowing about now. I mean, especially with the impact that we have on all of our landscapes, too, to see how historically that has evolved. And then the the other major topic that you've been involved in is the artist, Jimmy right. Jones. And right. so can you tell me a little bit about how you came to start working on uh, on Jim Jones's work? And, and sure. you knew him, I think, I did. also. He was a very good friend. Uh, he was one of the first people I met when I moved here in 1980. Oh, really? And we became friends. And then in 1983, I did a, a article on him for Southwest Art. And at the time, he and I were both building houses. He, oh. his magnificent house in Rockville, and me, my little house out west here. <laughs> and so we were always trading ideas back and forth and visiting each other's houses as the houses were going up. And so we became good friends. How did you guys meet the first time? Uh, met through my ex-wife. Introduced oh, I us. See. She knew uh-huh. Jimmy well uh-huh. and introduced uh-huh. us. So we were friends for years. And then uh, a couple years before he died, he had a show down in Springdale. I think it was 2007. So I went down there and someone said, you know, Jimmy's got emphysema. I thought, oh, my gosh, he's he's going to die. Yeah. And I had just made a little film for my Desolation book. And so I went to John Smith, a great filmmaker here at SUU, and said, hey, John, there's this great artist, Jimmy Jones. Uh, we need to make a film on him. Uh, what do you think? And he didn't know his work, but he said, okay, I'll let me look. He looked around, did some research on him, said, yeah, let's do it. So we did the film on Jimmy and... You know, I went on and that was done and Jimmy died in 2009 and, you know, the museum right. fundraising got going. And then a year after Jimmy died, uh, Gib Smith, the publisher up north, approached me. He had known my work, other work and he said, I know there's a museum that's going to be built here and Jimmy was involved in it and I love Jimmy. I love his work. I want to do a book on Jimmy and I want you to do it. And I said, Gibbs, I'm not an art historian. Um, he said, well, you know, you can research and write and you can do it. So, okay. So, wow, I didn't I know went, that's how it came um, about. And writing. And so I had a lot of help from various artists, yeah. uh, particularly around here Arlene Braithwaite, yeah. Annie Marvick, Eric Brown, Brad, Brad Holt, especially. Mm-hmm. Brad was very close to Jimmy. In fact, Jimmy taught. Brad to paint. Oh. Um, because he was very good friends with Brad's mother. And uh so they helped me talk about the paintings in a semi, I hope, intelligent way. Yeah. And then I knew how to research and, you know, write and find his story and it was fascinating. It was a a amazing project, a labor of love. I love Jimmy. He's one of my favorite people. He was just a fantastic human being. I absolutely one of the best people I've ever met in my life. So and it was great to learn his story. As somebody who knew him, what are what are some of the traits about him that you particularly loved? Jimmy was the kindest, sweetest man. He always wanted to know what you were doing. He was a great listener. He had a tremendous sense of humor. He loved to laugh. He loved to hear stories and laugh. Just really easy. And he was also one of the most well-read people I have ever met in my life. So really? we re- also really bonded over books because he was always reading stuff. And so we were always talking about books. He was so much better read than I am. It's phenomenal. Wow. Uh, so these are some things uh, people don't know perhaps yeah. about Jimmy unless they've read my book. And then you also have the, the San Blas years and that, that was about a time it, when he was in he was Mexico. In Mexico. It, essentially, I took the second chapter out of my biography and expanded it a little bit. This was for a, a show of his work at the Braithwaite Gallery the, of his Mexico period. So 
uh, I expanded that, and that became the catalog for that show. And those images are I've, are quite interesting and yeah, quite, different, quite than, different than the rest of his work. Yeah, his style really changed. That was his early work. Mm-hmm. And then in uh, 1975, he thought about a, a bicentennial project, and he thought he would try to paint his home park because oh. he had gotten sort of tired of doing – portrait and figure work and not feeling like he was growing. So he shifted, he tried that and it worked out pretty well. Then he went to Grand Canyon and spent a winter there and that transformed his life. And then he was straight on landscape ever after. And um, and then his style and his color and his palette really changed as he tried to capture the canyon country. Have you ever uh, wanted to get into do, doing any creative arts on your own because of this study? Uh, no. <laughs> I do pretty good stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, you mentioned your your love of reading and, and in sort of in the last uh, chunk of our time in the radio, um, I have one more song to play. But before we get into that, I'd love to sort of transition into learning a little bit more about your inspiration. And, and so uh, what books, or if, if I mean, I'm sure there are so many, but are there any that you could identify that are particularly inspiring? Inspiring to you either right now or that have been particularly inspiring to you over the years? Uh, there were a number of them. Um, Walden was a really important book, and I did my dissertation on that, Henry David Thoreau's Walden. Oh, what about uh, that book? Uh, well, I, you know, I'm into nature and environment, and that's the classic right. um, work on, on, on nature. Mm-hmm. And so it's just an amazing story. Uh, mm-hmm. Thoreau's life and his story and what he did out at Walden. And I uh, was fortunate enough to study with the Thoreau scholar, Walt Harding, who wrote the biography on Thoreau in the summer of 1983 in Concord, Massachusetts. Oh. So we would meet every day in the back of the uh, Thoreau Society house and talk about Thoreau. And then we'd go out to the sites. And, oh, how special. Yeah, that was amazing. Wow. Uh, So Walden was important. Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire was another one. Oh, yeah. Uh, When I first came out to visit here, when I was in graduate school, my dissertation director gave me this book and said, try this out. And here I am heading to Utah reading Edward Abbey's Desert Solitaire. And I go, oh, my gosh, this is where I'm going. Yeah. So that that was a big one. John Wesley Powell's Exploration of the Colorado River. When I got into river running, that was a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, And... I'm a big Hemingway and Faulkner fan from graduate school. I, I still teach seminars in mm. those, and I, I love those writers. Um, well, that was so another many. question. Is there is there one book that you, or or even one article that you always assign that's kind of f- to your students that you think is just a quintessential that all college students should read? This book or this <laughs> article, is there... Or essay? Is there anything mm. that really makes its way into all of your syllabi? Not all of my syllabi, because I teach a lot of different literature classes. Mm-hmm. Um, I in one of my, I think everyone should read Homer's The Odyssey. Oh, that's great! And I great. get to teach that every fall, and I, you know, it's just been one of my favorites for all time. Perfect. Well, thank you for that. Well, on that note, we'll play the last song that I have for you uh, for today, which is Alfonsina y el Mar by Avishi Cohen, a a great bass player who does some really interesting things. And we'll be back with the last segment of the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Por la blanda arena que lame el mar Tu pequeña abuela no vuelve más Un sendero solo de pena y silencio Llegó hasta el agua profunda Un sendero solo de penas mudas Llegó hasta la espuma Sabe Dios que angustia te acompañó, que dolores viejos cayó tu voz, 
para recostarse arrullada en el canto de las caracolas marinas. La canción que canta en el fondo oscuro del mar, la caracola. Te vas alfonsina con tu soledad, que poemas nuevos fuiste a buscar. Y una voz antigua de viento y de sal Te requiebra el alma y la está llevando Y te vas hacia allá como en sueño Dormida alfonsina vestida de mar Cinco sirenitas te llevarán Por caminos de algas y de coral Y fosforescentes caballos marinos harán Una ronda a tu lado Y los habitantes del agua van a jugar Pronto a tu lado Bájame la lámpara un poco más Déjame que duerma nutriza en paz Y si a Mael no le digas que estoy Dile que Alfonsina no vuelve Y si a Mael no le digas nunca que estoy Di que me te vas Alfonsina con tu soledad Que poemas nuevos fuiste a buscar Y una voz antigua de viento y de sal Te requiebra el alma y la está llevando Y te vas hacia allá como en sueño Dormida Alfonsina vestida de mal da, 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 da. Te vas Alfonsina con tu soledad Que poemas nuevos fuiste a buscar Y una voz antigua de viento y de sal te la quiebra el alma y la está llevando Y te vas hacia allá como en sueño Dormida Alfonsina vestida de mar Y te vas hacia allá como en sueño Dormida Alfonsina vestida de mar Okay, welcome back, everyone. This is the Apex Hour. I'm Lynn Vartan. I'm joined in the studio with Jim Ayton. Um, the song you just heard was Alfonsina y el Mar. Uh, the artist is Avishi Cohen, um, and also just really cool, interesting artist. So welcome back into the studio, Jim. Thank you. Um, I have just a couple more questions in the time that we have. And, and one that, that um, I've been really curious about is um, you've been here at SUU since the 80s and 1980. Uh, 1980 and um uh, one of the things that comes up not just with students but also for me personally is um inspiration motivation um and i'm just curious if you have any advice about that as you um really get settled in a place you have now seen many different administrations mm -hmm. many different evolutions you know maybe you could speak to either how things have changed and how you evolve and maybe some advice on how we can all continue to evolve as well that's a good question. I wish I had all the answers. <laughs> no, I know. It's an impossible question, I'm sure. But <laughs> work day by day. But um, yeah, I, I don't get as upset about 
uh, mm. things as I as I used to, particularly about things I might disagree with. It, ah. um, on the other hand, I have to say that um, I think things have gotten better. Things have gotten more professional. Great. Uh, the university has grown and evolved in in positive ways, yeah. both in terms of you know professionalization of the faculty, uh, the rising standards of faculty and students. The students have gotten better. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we're more progressive. Uh, so, in generally, I think things are heading in the right direction, and I'm glad they are. Yeah. How do you balance um, your your teaching life with your research life? Has that been has that ever been a challenge, or oh, has yeah. that been? Yeah, I mean, you're teaching four classes a semester. You know, in an R1 university, I'd be teaching half the load, right? And still expected to to publish. You know what I do, right? Um, but I've been very fortunate. I've had six sabbaticals. Oh, you have, which is an all time record. Will probably never be broken here. <laughs> so that has really allowed me time to. To produce these works, and I'm very grateful to university for. And I it's see. just the greatest thing ever. Okay. To have a sabbatical to to really get the project, the book, whatever it is, started. Right. Um, so that's been crucial for me. I and see. I could never have done it without that. I've of course had you know help with research, you mm -hmm. know grants or not grants, but you know funding from the department for mm -hmm. travel mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, and that's that's been fantastic too. And two last questions. One is, um, if you had to say the best advice that you were ever given, <laughs> do you have a sense of what that might be? <laughs> Perhaps don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> that's yeah, always that's good. <laughs> a good one. Um, I don't know. I I think as a teacher and a scholar, one of the best advices I got from one of my undergraduate teacher I was stayed really close to was just. Read, 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 read. Oh, I love that. That's great. Okay, that's a good one. That's very inspiring. And then the last question that I like to ask is kind of our our fun question, and that's what's turning you on this week? And it could be anything. It could be um, something you're reading or something you're listening to. We've had people say it, TV shows. It could be a favorite restaurant. It could be mm. anything. But Jim Ayton, what is turning you on this week? Well, I've started a really interesting book that my son-in-law's mother gave me. She's an artist. It's called The Judgment of Paris. Ooh. It's by Ross King, and it's about uh, the great change in Paris from the uh, the painters before the Impressionists to the rise of the Impressionists. Oh, uh, that sounds the, great. The, the Salon des Refuses. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. uh, it's mostly about Monet. Uh-huh. Uh, so that's that's pretty exciting. My wife and I have had a lot of discussions about it already. And oh, she's well, an artist. Yeah, that she's a fantastic artist. Yep, she is. Hi, Carrie, <laughs> if you're listening. Um, so tell me again the name of that book. The Judgment of Paris. And the author? Ross King. Oh my gosh, I'm definitely going to check that out. Well, that is all the time that we have today. I'd like to thank you so much, Jim, for being in the studio Thanks with us. Thanks for having me. And we will remind everyone that the newest book is called The Crimson Cowboys, The Remarkable Odyssey of the 1931 Claflin Emerson Expedition. And you can find it uh, online anywhere, uh, but it is the University of Utah Press is the publisher. And we will be signing out for this week at the Apex Hour. We will look forward to seeing you next week and um, have a great week in between here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.